was a beautiful song. Yeah. I really enjoy it. Glad you're here today. It's always a privilege to be up here. Y'all have been praying for me, and you will get a message today. Because I believe that no matter who's up here, if you pray for a message, you're going to get it. Amen. The title of the sermon today is actually uh, part of a verse out of uh, 2 Corinthians. I believe it's chapter 7. I think it's the last verse. The indescribable gift. And starting out with the verse, uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, it makes you almost not want to get up here. because if, if, if you can wrap your mind around Jeremiah 17, 9, then you've got most of the battle already whipped because you understand your spiritual poverty. And that's how uh, Jesus started out to be attitudes. He started out with... Uh, Blessed are those who mourn. What are they mourning? They're mourning their spiritual poverty because they understand what's in their heart. And they know that they need something, but they haven't quite figured out what they need yet. They, these, let's go to the sermon. Another uh, verse that we hear quite a bit, that I actually quote quite a bit, is uh, Acts chapter 17. Verse 26. It's better to get up here without this. We wouldn't have any good preaching today without this. Without this. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And um, it goes, And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. Now that, that one blood, actually if you, in, in the uh, most Bibles it's italicized blood. But that actually means one man. But we know by this verse that, that we all came from Adam. And there's, there's a uh, verse in chapter 1 of Genesis that says that God breathed the life into Adam. Well, I was taught that that word life is actually plural. And if you read this uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, you can see that that word could be plural. God breathed the breath of lives into Adam. The whole human race was in Adam when God made Adam. That, that, that sounds kind of strange, but the, the human race is a, corp, a corporate entity and I can't think of another way to, to describe it. Fans keep changing my face. Here. Got to nail it down. If you look at humanity as, uh, as a body, as a stream, and the human race is as a stream, and, and I want you to keep that, fix that, and, and hang that on the hook in your mind. The incredible good news of salvation to be claimed to the world before the end comes. Now, that is uh, Matthew 24, 14. Let's go to Matthew 24, 14. I'm actually cold up here. I think I have a controller going on. Turn these all low if you could, Donald. I don't know if I got the right button or not. Mm -hmm. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, six verse 6 to 12. Everybody should know 
this particular one that's here in Adventist, I believe it. Revelation 14, starting with verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those on the face of the earth, or on the earth, and to every nation, tongue, and tribe. So this is a, a global mission. Uh, with our technology to the, that we have today, we can reach out, we can, reach, we can touch the whole world today. It's amazing that how the, the gospel could travel around the world very easily. So, as uh, it's been said, we are living in the last days. And, of course, Paul believed he was living in the last days when he penned down the, 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 his epistles. But looking at the signs of the times, it's like, wow, this could be it. We could be that generation. They could be alive when Jesus comes back. You know, it, 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 right now, with us in the Adventist Church in America, it's, it's not a, you know, we, look, we, we think of that, but it's not really a big deal because there's no persecution going on, no real persecution going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yet. And, and it could happen any, any time. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give, him, give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That great city, because she has made of all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worship the beast and his image and receive the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels <clears throat> and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image. Whoever receives the mark of his name, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen. So our situation in, in Adam, we, as in Acts 17, 26, it says we all were one entity. We, were, we, we, we all came from Adam. We were all in Adam. So We're all an extension of Adam after he sinned. And there's, there's this word, it's called solidarity. And we in the United States don't really understand solidarity. And there's, a, there's this term, it's called biblical solidarity. And the only way I can describe it, and, and what we're all in Adam, we're actually all in Moses, we're all in Noah. Uh, we all came from Adam, and then we all came from Noah. So. But so everything that affected—I I want to stay with Adam. But everything that affected Adam before he sinned was passed on to to you and me. And that word, that solidarity, you can prove the solidarity by uh, looking at Hebrews. I believe it's chapter seven. And I'm paraphrasing now, but it says that Levi paid taxes to Melchizedek through Abraham. Well, Levi didn't come for hundreds of years after Abraham. Levi was in, in Abraham's loins, so to speak. So he paid tithes to Melchizedek. So that, that's a type of solidarity. Okay, the human race is an extension of Adam's life. <coughs> Therefore, the life that Adam passed on to us was sold to Satan. Satan caused Adam and Eve to, to become self... They, they were God-dependent before Satan came and tempted them, and they became self-dependent. This is what happened when, when Adam yielded to Satan's temptations. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6.
Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. Who delivered this to, to Satan? It says, And I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. And I think this is this is reaching pretty low because this is this is the creature trying to tempt the creator. And and what I what I want to say here is that Jesus called Satan the prince of this world. He, he said it three times in uh, John chapter 12, 31, and verse 31, uh, chapter 14, verse 30, and chapter 16, verse 11. He calls him the prince of this world. So, Jesus has come to buy us back, so to speak. Let's go to Romans 5.18. And to this, y'all heard me just talk about Romans 5.18. That this verse is, I believe, is the, one of the, the pivotal verses in all of Scripture. Yeah. Romans 5.18. It, it, the whole chapter, I believe the whole chapter is a pivotal chapter in, in all of Scripture, but everything goes, actually revolves around this Romans 5.18. Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Now this, this one man, who's the one man? It says, resulting in condemnation. So the whole human race was under condemnation because of Adam. Well, are, are we guilty of Adam's sin? We're not guilty of Adam's sin, but we start with the condemnation, and the only way I can explain that is uh, two people that are married, and they have a child. These two people are married, they have AIDS, and they have a child who gets the AIDS. Now, is the child guilty? No, but the, but the two people that had the AIDS, they're, they're the guilty part. So the, the sin doesn't pass on to the, the, ch the children. If you look at uh, Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon him. So it's the one, it's the person who sinned who has to pay for the sin. Let's go back to Romans 5.18. It says, Therefore, as though one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even though... Through one man's righteous act, and who is this one man? Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift, I'd like to emphasize that, free gift came to all men. Is that everybody? Yes. Resulting in justification of life. So because of Adam's sin, we all became slaves. Let's look at... Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14. It says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. So, this says we're all slaves to sin. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And he made alive. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Let's go to Titus 3 5. What, I, what I'm uh, getting at is we are all, we, we're, we've all died spiritually. And why, why did we die spiritually? I mean, we had nothing to do with, with, with this death. We have all died spiritually since the Holy Spirit left us. Actually, the Holy Spirit left Adam. But if we were in Adam, 
The Holy Spirit left us too. It doesn't seem quite fair, but I have no, I have no answer for that. It's a mystery. It's like sin, the mystery of iniquity. Uh, I'm reading from Titus 3 5 now. And, and this verse always um, perplexed me because it says, I'm going to start with verse 4. It says, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. So our righteous works are not even counted. It says our righteous works. So what does it say in Isaiah? I can't remember the exact verse. It says all of our righteous acts are as filthy rags. Our righteous acts. Which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So we had to be renewed. So this is telling me we were dead. The, the way we had, how, why would we be renewed if we weren't dead? So we were, we lost the Holy Spirit when Adam sinned. So you and I are born without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now this is our inheritance from birth. We had no choice. It doesn't matter where you come from. We inherited these problems. The Greek word for this life that we inherited, and this is, I said all that to say, <laughs> anyway, I love this because I learned something new this week. Actually, I had been, I've been taught this before, and I said, one of these days, I'm going to learn it enough to say it in front of the church. And anyway, don't, don't, like I've said before, don't believe what I'm telling you. You need to look this stuff up for yourself. This is, this is good stuff because it, 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 it comes out of here. The Greek word for this ruined life that we've been given is bios. B-I-O-S. Bios. Let's look at Luke chapter 8 verse 14. It says, now, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life. Now this word life is that word bios, and bring no fruit to maturity. This is from the parable of the sower. Now, let's go to uh, 1 John Chapter 2, verse 15. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now that pride of life is this bios I'm talking about. There are three basic drives of the sinful human nature, and they are... And we are tempted by many different temptations, but every temptation they come down to these same basic desires, these, these same basic lusts. It says the lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So everything, all of our sins tend to come to, to this area here. Because it says uh, in John, I'm not going to go to John chapter 16, verse 33, it says Jesus overcame the world. But if you back up to uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it's, it, Jesus is saying, overcome the way I overcame. Now I'm paraphrasing. You're going to have to go look that up. You can write that down. Chapter 3, verse 20 of Revelation. Jesus says, overcome the way I overcame. And, and you ask yourself, what did Jesus overcome? Well, he, it says right here, Jesus overcame the world. Uh, and that's in John 16, 33. Jesus says, I overcame the world. And if you come to here, first John chapter 2, verse 16, it tells you what the world is. And also chapter 1, I mean, first John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, this is not of the Father, but of the world. This bios is a Greek word for the ruined life. 
want you to remember this word bias because we're going to talk about bias as we go. The word lies are the sinful life that you and I were born with. Mankind needs a savior because of this bias, <coughs> this, uh, this life. It is unchangeable. We can't change ourselves. We're, we're, we're at the mercy of this sin. If you read Romans chapter 7, we don't have to read up, time to read all of Romans chapter 7, but it talks about this. We are uh, we're slaves to that one whom we obey, which is Romans 6.16. I don't want to get, throw too many verses out there. It's, going to get, it's already confusing. But it cannot produce for us a righteousness that qualifies us for heaven. Our bios life can never make it into heaven. Jesus Christ is, is our only Savior. There's only one way under heaven that we can make, make it to heaven. And that, that way is through Jesus. There's only, that's the only way. His salvation is central, is the central theme of Paul's theology. I mean, we can all agree on that, right? Christ is the gospel, the good news of salvation. This is why Paul preaches in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The mechanics of how this was done is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. Crucified. 
You hear that in Paul's letters. He, he says it in uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. He says it in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. He says it. Excuse me? Uh, yes. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. He says, in the life which I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now this life is another. It says, the Greek word for the eternal divine life of Christ that saved us is zoe. So, Zoe is, is, is spelled Z-O-E. And the life that belongs to us in Adam is bios. Zoe is always used for the eternal life of Christ. Now, in our English Bibles, we, got, we have the word life. We, we can't determine, unless we go look in uh, the concordance, that life is either bios or life is Zoe. So, when you see life, and when it pertains to Jesus, of course, it's, it's, the, uh, it's used for the eternal life of Christ. It says, in our English Bibles, it is always used for Zoe. <clears throat> the problem is our English. The problem is my English. The problem is our English. Because we, we, we can't tell the difference when you're just reading through the Bible. Let's go to John, John 1.4. And I'll give you an example. John 1 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the life of men. Now, this life is that Zoe, Z O E. This Zoe life, Adam had the Zoe life before he committed sin, before he gave in to temptation, before he ate. He did what God told him not to do. And he lost his Zoe life, and it was replaced by the Bios life. Now this Bios life, will die. The Zoe life can never die, because it's, it's divine. Now, we're, we're, it gets a little more interesting. How God saved mankind, and how did God save mankind in Christ? For the Father to legally qualify Christ to be the Savior of mankind, He had to unite this divine Zoe life with this Bios life. Christ, when He, at the incarnation, He laid down His Zoe life. He, he laid it aside because when, when Jesus was here, He didn't use His divinity. But he still had the Zoe life. But he lived in this bios. He was born of Mary. Mary, from Mary he got his bios life. From the Holy Spirit he got his Zoe. I, 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 that ain't how you're supposed to talk. You're not supposed to say Zoe life, bios life. It's either life or bios or Zoe or life. So, in John 1.14, it says that the Word became flesh. This Zoe became flesh. He put, this Zoe put on the bios. The union between Christ's divine Zoe life and humanity's corporate bios life resulted in Christ becoming the second Adam, or the last Adam. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15.45. The first Adam burned us. I mean, we were burned by the first Adam. The second Adam redeemed us. And where did he redeem us? Where did, we, where, where, where did the second Adam redeem us? This, at the incarnation. When Adam... Okay, remember I told you to remember that the, the stream of humanity is, 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 is an entity? What God did was he took the Zoe... And he put it into the bio stream of humanity. So he changed all of humanity. Uh, past, present.
present, and future. He changed it all with this Zoe, because Adam had sinned and caused it to be bios, which was not eternal, which Zoe is eternal. But this doesn't save us. Just changing the stream doesn't save us. This legally qualified Christ to be